Thank you very much, Tony. It's a great joy to be here, to be at this gathering of the provincial chapter of uh, St. John the Baptist province, gathering here in St. Myrd, Indiana. So thank you very much. Thanks, we're delighted that you're here. Um, we wanted to help the friars understand a little bit about what your day-to-day -day life is like. Um, I mean, I know that they know that their knowledge, except for gatherings like this, is that they get letters from you. They don't like a lot of letters, by the way. And um, they know that you travel, and they know that you visit people, and they know that you probably read all the time. Um, but, for example, this week, maybe you could start at Sunday and then tell me, just walk me through the week and where you're going and when. Okay, on Sunday, I was actually preparing uh, for a meeting that was going, that is taking place right now in just outside of Rome, a place called Sassone. Uh, there's a meeting, the first international congress for the OFM Franciscans in, the his, in our history, focusing on missionary evangelization. 130 participants, and so I was able to go and spend, prepare, and then spend uh, Monday with them. Uh, and then begin to prepare for the trip for Tuesday, um, flying from Rome to to the United States uh, through New York, Indianapolis, and this morning here. So that that was Tuesday. Wednesday is the great opportunity to be here uh, with the brothers uh, to be able to experience. Obviously, I, one of the things I have to do or get to do is talk a lot, but I also try to create a space to listen when it's possible first. When I go someplace, to listen first, and then. Uh, after having listened and already have studied something about the brothers I'll meet with, then be able to talk with them about some of the concerns they have and also about some of the great opportunities that, that are before them. Uh, I will leave um, tomorrow morning early. I'll fly through New York back to Rome so that I can prepare to go and meet with Pope Francis to welcome him to, the, uh, to our church um, in Bethlehem when he comes. I'll accompany a part of his delegation on several other visits to an ecumenical prayer service. And then um, the following day, I will welcome him to uh, our shrine church in Jerusalem, uh, where he will, uh, together with the, um, the patriarch of the Orthodox patriarch, Bartholomew, will be having meetings. And he'll also be meeting with the, uh, the, 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 the patriarch, the Latin patriarch. So I, that, that's kind of this week and the following week. Uh, let's see, next week I'll, I'll get back uh, just in time to prepare to come back to the United States to participate in two, three other chapters of the Friars here in the United States. And then I'll spend June in East Africa uh, visiting the Friars and having a chance to listen to what's going on there and to give them encouragement, to encourage them to continue to stay the course and to continue to give witness to the Gospel with great joy. So, out of every month, you're on an airplane maybe two weeks of that. Uh, out, of every, um, out of every two months, every two months, we have a meeting of the government of the order for two weeks in Rome. There, there we get a chance to talk about some of the, uh, the good things that are happening and also some challenges, difficulties for which the friars have written to ask us for some advice. So I will meet with the vicar of the order, uh, Julio Bonader from Argentina, and with uh, eight counselors for the different regions of the world. And we talk together about these issues. So uh, when I'm not there during those two weeks, a fair amount of the other time, so s probably five weeks out of eight weeks, I'm traveling, visiting the friars. And what's the longest stretch of time you have been able to be home in one place? Uh, well, I, I was uh, home for just about a month um, um, back, when was this, back in the late fall, because I picked up a parasite in one of the countries I was visiting. And so we had the two-week meeting, uh, and I, then the doctor ordered me to rest a bit, so I stayed home a little longer. But in the middle of that, I had to run off to Geneva just for a day to be able to give testimony to the Human Rights Council. So, so but, but by and large, it, it's, that's probably the longest stint that I've had to be able to, to stay present in the Korea. And what is your routine like when you're home? For example, what would a typical day be? Typical day would be morning prayer and mass at 7, followed by a bit of a breakfast. And then by 8.30, uh, I'm in the office to begin work. I try to use the early part of the morning to do reading of emails, reading of letters and things, looking at some issues. 
And then the, back, the second half of the morning, sometimes meeting with friars, provincials, uh, other people who, who want to talk about, who come to, the, to come to Rome. And then in the afternoons, sometimes meeting with commissions um, and, and then Oros working on special projects, working on preparing, reading and preparing for uh, talks that I might have to give, uh, places I might have to visit. I, I try to meet before going to a province or region. I meet with the, our, our, our advisor for that region, a definitor. We meet with people, uh, the uh, formation and uh, studies, the secretary. We meet, I meet with the secretary for mission evangelization. I meet with the, the, the director of the Office of Justice and Peace. We meet together to talk, to get a co comprehensive view of what are some of the challenges, what are some of the opportunities in a particular country. So we actually do these meetings as a preparation before I would go. So most of the information you get about what's going on in the border, I mean, does that come from the internet or does it come from advisory groups or, or do you just voraciously read newspapers or what? Uh, there are three sources of information I could probably say. The first source comes from the friars themselves uh, through the the provincial minister or the custos or the president of a foundation in the case where we have several foundations, Myanmar, um, we have foundation in India, we have foundation in Brazil. So they, the friars themselves would be writing or the, the definitor or the counselor would be providing information from his visits and his contacts. So we would, that would be the first source. The second source could come from the Vatican, from the Secretary of State or from the Office for Evangelization. Uh, or it comes from uh, apostolic nuncios. We have discussions with them to find out what's going on. That's to get the larger context, what's happening in the country in terms of religion, politics, economics, culture, and what the, or if there are any uh, special ways that the friars can be of help to, with the, to the local church and to the people. And the third source then would be talking newspapers, other articles, or even um, I, I tend to talk with people in State Department. Uh, I talk with people working in the State Departments of other governments to get some background. I talk to ambassadors who are in Rome to get further background, particularly if they were going into an area where there are many, many political issues, just to have the background. We're not, I'm, I, don't, I don't speak about the politics when I'm there, but it, it's helpful to know what the friars are living, what the church is living, because that gives me a better platform on which to stand, and then we can help formulate, uh, rather than making silly, stupid comments and, and suggestions that aren't going to work uh, because we don't understand the context. Uh, we still, I still sometimes make silly ideas, you know, but that's okay. That comes, that comes with, the, with the terrain. You must have an excellent memory. Um, I've just been impressed with, for example, the individual names that you know, uh, the ministries you mentioned things that people are doing. I mean, is that, or do you just have to work really hard at remembering things? Uh, it, it's, it's a funny thing. I can remember almost to a date, someone I've met, I can remember where it's happened, and I can remember what we've talked about. What I sometimes can't remember is the name, which I feel embarrassed about. I'd love to be able to remember the names of, of, of all the brothers and other people. But someone who's also a Franciscan, he's a affiliate of the order of Holy Name Province, but of the order, is Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. And Cardinal McCarrick's reputation was that he could remember the names of the parishioners he would meet when he would go out to visit in Washington, D.C. He would remember the names of their children, the names of their parents, and the names of their cousins. Uh, I don't have that type of memory, but I think it's important to, uh, it's just something that uh, maybe it's, it's in, in my mind, I don't know, but I'm able to try to peg someone with an event because that, the event then becomes an opportunity to be able to return to find out what's happened in that person's life since that time, since we, particularly if it's a, really a significant event in their life, in the life of their people, the life of the order. So. Do, you, do you read for pleasure or do you have time to read for pleasure? And if you do, what do you I don't get to read too much, really, for, for pleasure. Um, I, I read Franciscan sources a lot. Uh, I've had to kind of catch up because uh, it was not my expertise. I tend still to read uh, things like uh, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Le Monde uh, out of France. I listen a little bit to BBC. I listen to Al Jazeera to get different perspectives on problems rather than just one. Um, and then I, I, I do, I read a lot of, um, I read small articles, I read uh, foreign policy journals, I read uh, uh, theological journals just to try to 
to give up. What I enjoy reading, uh, I, I really like to read, uh, I, I love the Millennial series, uh, Steg Lassen, who did a three series, and there's one more book, I think, in his computer or two, I'm hoping he, unfortunately, he died at a young age, but hopefully there'll be one or two more books coming out. Um, just the intrigue, uh, so, uh, yes. What do you do to take care of yourself, I, I physically? I mean, mm. exercise or, or what, are you, what are you able to do? I take my life in my hands and I ride a bicycle in Rome. And that's really, <laughs> it almost seems like a contradiction uh, to say that, uh, Tony, because uh, Rome is not the most uh, friendly driving city in the world. But uh, I've never felt, uh, people seem to kind of get used to, they, they're used to these motorcycles riding in and out. So I, I kind of blend in and um, I'm attentive to what's around. But I, I do try to do that. And so occasionally there's a gem, uh, the Catholic family that knows the friars. Uh, the gem was blessed 27 years ago by a friar from the Curia. So they let me, when I can, they let me use the gem for free. And I go down there occasionally, but I don't get to do that too often. Yeah. I walk when I can. Uh, and then I, I try to watch what I eat. I, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that, um, that our relationship with food says something about our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. So we, just as we are respectful to other people, respectful to God, we have, I think we, have, we need to find a way to be respectful with food so that we understand as we eat, we remember those who, who cannot have enough to eat this day, always. They are at the table with us, our brothers and sisters. And does that translate to any particular diet? I, 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 yes, a number of years ago when the, in the, this is going to age me a little bit, in the, in the 70s when I was at university, uh, there was a world grain crisis. And uh, there was a call to reduce or eliminate the eating of meat. The hope was that that would translate into a economics of distribution that would favor the poor, the brothers and sisters who don't have enough to eat. And so I decided then that I really could live without meat because it takes six pounds of corn to feed, to get one, one pound of meat. So I said, I can do without this if it means other people can eat. And so I've, I, I'm not a vegetarian. I just don't eat meat so I can remember always to have other people at the table with me. Obviously, your life changed dramatically when you were elected. Um, what's the most dramatic change for you, um, other than just that you have to travel a lot? The, the traveling is not so dramatic because uh, as a child, our family traveled quite a bit. Uh, we traveled on vacations other times. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of that. Uh, there's a little sp spirit of wanderlust in me to, to have a new opportunity to learn new things, to see, new, meet new people. Um, I, I think when I worked for the, I worked to the Bishop's Conference for six years and there as a policy advisor, I traveled about 45% of my time. When I went to Franciscans International, I traveled about 55% of my time. And when I went to Catholic Relief Services as a policy advisor, I traveled about 65% of my time. So I think already the traveling is in and of itself, it's not uh, it's so much of a, I think the, the, the greatest challenge is to arrive someplace and not be so tired, either from the trip or from previous engagements, to not be able to listen and to enter into the context of what's going on. I think this is a great challenge. Um, and I think the other thing is another challenge of the travels are that I have to listen to people speak in, in at least three or four languages. So I try to, I don't speak, I speak some Spanish now, but I'm not as good as I would like, I, but I understand about 95%. I speak, I use the Italian when I travel, I use French when I travel, I listen to Portuguese. Uh, I think that's another thing though that, that takes a lot of energy is trying to listen to people, allow them to speak in their language and not oblige them to speak in mine. And I think this is very important as well because the story is very different if they can tell it from their own experience, from their own hearts, the language that they, in which they speak to God, if they can say it in that language. Obviously, there are times when we need translators uh, to be able to help, but the hope and the attempt is... So these are, these are, these are just challenges that come with the job, I think. Uh, um, I, again, I think the other challenge is to, to demonstrate in my own life what I would expect brothers in the order to live. And there, I have to admit my own limitations and failures mm -hmm. and, uh, and depend on the prayers of the brothers and the poor Claire's and other people who are praying for me. Uh, because none of us deserve any of these jobs we have. We are only just servants, that's all, nothing more. And that's what we're called to be. Along that line, was it difficult for you 
obviously something changed when you were elected. And, and I'm guessing that before there were not people standing up and applauding when you entered rooms. I, how did you sort of adjust to a difference in possible perception of who you were because of your title? I think um, I, I, I admit that people in different cultures honor and reverence people differently. So one of the greatest things I have to do, and this is all part of just, I think there's a, there's a, there's a humility, as Pope Francis would demonstrate to us, there's a humility that comes with responsibility. And so we have to allow people to express in their language and their ways the way they want to honor or receive. And in part, I think what I see behind that is there's a real desire for people. Uh, they're not applauding me as person. They're, they're saying that we hope you will bring us a message. We're hoping that you will be a blessing to us. And I think if I understand it in that language, then it's not about me. It's about the message that people are longing to hear. And then I start to pray, and then I get worried, because what message can I offer them? Um, it, it's kind of, I think Pope Francis would feel the same way in listening to him, meeting with him several times now. I don't think it would be much different uh, even in his mind, but I, each of us deal with this differently. But I, and then I also remind people that, uh, that the, the two words that describe even the office of Minister General or any office in the order is frate minore. We are minor brothers, no matter what, and we are brothers. That is what defines us, not the office. What would you personally like to be able to do better? And, and, and what maybe gifts or abilities do you have that you think help you in this position? Um, and I wish I could speak Italian a little better. I wish I could speak Spanish adequately because then I could, I could respond uh, even more effectively to, to what uh, maybe some of the questions and also enter into the dialogue. Uh, I'm saying that in one sense, I think I'm okay in the Italian now, but the, the Spanish, I wish I could, because I have, we have a lot of brothers in the order who speak Spanish. And so to try to, again, try to enter into their lived reality. Um, so I wish that, and you know, I, I, I had a huge time to study Italian, four weeks. Yeah, that's what you get. You go to Rome and you, they send you away for one month and you come back and, and you're in meetings in Italian and that's all. So uh, that, maybe that's one thing I hope for any future minister general and definitors of the order that they will take, initially take some extra time to build, get some tools, necessary tools to be able to work together. I would also hope the next administration would rely on some other tools on just community building tools to begin to develop a common vision together. You can pick this up as you go along, uh, and, and we have, and we work very well together. But there might be some tools at the very beginning that could be helpful, I think. Uh, and I think we, the other thing is, I think we need to have a, some type of process of evaluation. I think the Minister General and the General Administration needs to be evaluated on a regular basis. Not, for, not to criticize, it's, we, we, it's to learn. So we become really a learning um, environment where, where uh, it's not just about other friars, other Franciscans uh, educating themselves, updating themselves. All of us must do this. Because that's the way we can continue, I think, to keep on, keep the edge, if you will, and to be able to listen more attentively. And it's not, it's not personal. This is the most important thing. It's really not. It's about the mission. We can keep the mission at the center. And I think that's always a challenge to make sure the mission is at the center of our lives. Jesus Christ, the gospel life we're called to, and the tremendous world that, that is longing for a message of goodness, of hope, of blessedness. Speaking of icebreakers. <laughs> Ellen works. Um, speaking of the next administration, are there things that you would like to accomplish or have in place, or are there, is there a particular legacy that you're thinking this is what I'd like to do or leave or make happen while I'm in this position. The, the only legacy that, that I would hope that I could leave any place I go is that I've left a legacy that people believe that I've been a brother to them. That's the only legacy. That's the greatest legacy that I can leave. Any of us, I think, is Friars Minor. I think the other thing, though, in terms of, um, I, I hope we will be able to leave the next administration uh, sufficient information so that they can begin the, um, the six-year term that they will have 
understanding what some of the key issues are, what are some of the key strengths and opportunities that are awaiting the order. Uh, that would be very helpful to them, I think. And then to make sure that all of the administrative uh, materials, all of the, the duties that, that have been left to us that we began with six years ago, that we can conclude most of those so that the new administration come, comes in and, and it's a fresh start for them. Fresh in the sense that there, any of the, the um, tasks that should have been done in the six years, where possible that those are complete. And then I think it, it allows people to come in and be able to, to uh, a continuity, but a continuity with much creativity to go toward a future that's going to be very different. So I think that's... Do you have ideas, plans, thoughts, uh, things that you might like to happen next for you in your life after this? Yes, I would like to, I was just saying this jokingly, I'd like to, to do a sabbatical. It would be the first one it would be great to do. Uh, I would like it to be a working sabbatical. I think it's important to do some uh, work to support the community and then to uh, be able to spend a f three or four months uh, in Mexico, probably, or someplace in the South, uh, working on Spanish, because anywhere in the world now, Spanish is important. It's one of those three or four most important languages now. Uh, I think I would also uh, like to uh, spend some time reading um, some different areas, looking at some different possibilities, and writing. But one area which I will, I will, I, I continue to engage in, I will continue, is the area of, of of peace and reconciliation. It's something which I feel the world is, is desperate for. And we as respond, as Franciscans, we have, we, we, we've been gifted a charism for this. So I would hope to be able to develop additional skills in that area. And not, this is not personal, but how do we make people care about things like the Nigerian school children uh, abducted or, or the crisis in the Ukraine? What do, we, what do we have to do to make people care? It depends on, on what part of the world. I mean, it's, it's always um, sociologists in Chicago years ago in the 50s and 60s. And I, because I'd studied in Chicago, I, I, I learned of him. But he said, if you want something to be important in people's lives, you need to help them see it where they live. You need to help them experience it where they live. It, it needs to have a face and a name. So the most important thing is to bring a, bring a person, bring a face, make it real for people. If they see and listen to someone who comes from that environment where possible and tells their story, that seems to have a greater impact than reading things or listening to the news, if you will. I remember, um, of all people, there was a senator um, in, from North Carolina, and I'll leave his name unmentioned, but he, he, he could not... Uh, he was very, very um, opposed to any funding for people living with HIV and AIDS in the world. And so he blocked funding for a very long time until he met a Jesuit priest who took him to a residence in Nairobi that the Jesuit priest had created called Miombani, and where he got to meet children who were in HIV infected because they inherited from their mother. He could not blame them for any moral behavior, for any laxity. He saw these children. He came home and became one of the greatest advocates for funding for HIV and AIDS in the world. So just to, it, it's, it's got to be personal. People need to see the face of, of, of the human person. Then it becomes, I think that's what Franciscans, we have, the, we have the privilege. We are connected with people on the ground. We can make these connections. We need to find ways of, of maximizing those. And just for any young people, might be watching this or see this. Um, how would you describe life as a Franciscan in, in a way that is clear and honest, but it makes them understand that it's a very good life if they happen to be interested in learning more about it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, the one thing that seems to be true about the younger generation is they have a great desire to serve on the people. This is something which they have told me, which in, in different groups and stuff. So I, I think uh, it's probably what we as Franciscans need to do is create more spaces where we are listening to young people. We're actually allowing them to tell us what they need instead of us telling them what they need. I think that would be step number one. Step number two, then, is to try to help them connect with, in the area of service, where they can take their skills and develop their skills 
to place them at the service of other people. And so there would be another way that we could connect with them. I think after that, it's God's grace. I think if they go, they meet, uh, they get engaged, they will start asking questions themselves. Maybe they would say, gee, I'd like to do this a little more full time. I'd like to be involved in people's lives in this way. Uh, yeah, I could make a lot of money. Yeah, I could pursue a, a good career. Maybe I should still do that. But even if I, whether I'm interested in becoming a Franciscan religious or, or priest or, or, or just pursue a, a life as a committed layperson, as a disciple of Jesus, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lens out of which I should try to, I should be able to read things. And that lens uh, should take us to, to, the, to, to the places where people could, would love to have someone accompany them on the road. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the greatest service we could do because after that, God's grace. Uh, this is the amazing thing is I, when I was in high school, uh, in college, I never, who would ever think I'd be speaking three or four languages? I would have traveled, I would have met with presidents of countries, I would have met with, with uh, three popes. I would have, these are not, and I'm not saying this to, to say anything about me, but it's just saying what adventure can happen in our lives, what newness can happen if we open ourselves up to it and keep open. And I say this to any young person. Just stay open. Life's a, it's a construction project. It's in, it's in construction. Don't give up. Don't back away from it. Don't be a runaway or be afraid of it. Embrace it and just go forward. And uh, I think that's my few words I would say. I know you have to run. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Mm -hmm.